and thank you for joining us for this installment of the FUSE video series, Open Source Technologies in Clinical Data Analytics. My name is Michael Rimler, and I am the Open Source Technologies Director for FUSE. Joining us today is Mike Stackhouse, Chief Innovation Officer at Atoris Research. In recent years, Mike has embedded himself in activities related to open source solutions for clinical data analytics, and he's spoken extensively on the topic uh, through individual presentations, webinars, panels, and keynote addresses. It's a pleasure to have you here today. Thank you for joining us to kick off this first of a five-part series on open source technologies in clinical data analytics. I'm excited to be here. So let's just jump in. I, I think we met for the first time in Raleigh in 2018 at the first US Connect. Uh, I, I noticed that you had a, a clear passion for programming languages, which are typically referred to as open source languages, such as Python and, and R. Can you talk a little bit about where your passion for Python and R come from? I know you were a tr traditionally a statistical programmer at the time, so so why be an agent for change? Yeah, so growing up as a stat programmer, the first thing that really caught my eye and interest was macro programming because um, the idea of automating and trying to take things of just kind of the redundant tasks that we do in programming and then uh, finding a way to automate that, make it easier, see how we can make a lot of the tasks that we do faster um, for everyday activities. And in pursuing that further and further, um, we had a Unix um, system. So uh, looking into what you were able to do with that, I um, found shell scripting and the different utilities that my department had created to try to see what more could come from that. Um, and then from there, I kind of caught a bug of like, what other tools um, do I have access to? What other things can I find here um, that I can play with? Um, and Python was the first thing that I started jumping into. And I really got enamored with um, all the tools that you could use it for, all the things that you could produce with it, um, the tasks that in a couple lines of code could make things that programmers were doing and just manual copy and paste, just moving files um, in everyday tasks uh, just exponentially faster. So it really kind of just flowed out of there. I got really interested in utility development and seeing how I could make our department more efficient and um, automate away the things that I didn't want to have to do manually. But data science was this hybrid of statistics and computer science, and it was just this niche that I really felt like I fell into. And in my master's degree, we use basically Python for everything. We use R for different things. And I'm digging into the different worlds of machine learning or natural language processing or data visualization. Um, and th there's different applications and just seeing all the tools um, that were available out there. So that really kind of drove this passion to see what can we bring back to this industry um, that's going on in these different domains of analytics um, and domains of analysis and um, computer science out there um, to make what we do more efficient, to make what we do faster, uh, more reliable, better, um, and just bring um, all the power that's out there in the open source world and just the data science world uh, to more of what we do on a daily basis as stat programmers working on clinical trials. Yeah, that efficiency argument really resonates with me and some of the work that, that I've been involved with as well. Now, at the next US Connect, which I think was Baltimore, um, you and I connected with three other uh, individuals in the industry and started putting together a FUSE working group project called Open Source Technologies in Clinical Research. Um, this eventually evolved into a proper FUSE working group, Data Visualization and Open Source Technologies, which you now co-lead with uh, Han Ming Tu and Nick Maisel. Uh, what are some of the ongoing efforts within DVOST that people might want to learn about and perhaps get involved with? One of the ones that's kind of nearest and dearest to my heart um, has been the CAMIS project, um, which is one that you and I started together. Um, uh, I guess well over a year, year and a half ago um, now. And um, part of the purpose of that was starting to have the second phase discussion of using alternative languages, um, focusing in on R, which has become so popular um, in the clinical research world and understanding how that applies to the domain of clinical research in the traditionally SAS and commercial language dominated world where we kind of have the, this one method that we've been using for so long. Um, the implications of that, um, the implications of how some numbers just are not going to numerically be identical based on the statistical method or just underlying things, the implementation out of your control or understanding differences in implementation um, so that you can properly um, have that discussion instead of looking at the number on a page and saying these don't match and we can't use this. Um, and that's a post-validation discussion. 
that's one of the ones that is a really great initiative uh, that has uh, evolved into collaboration with PSI Ames um, and has had input from our consortium. We just had a white paper publication of that project. Additionally, um, the Julia project for uh, high performance computing, looking at Julia as a language and really what the place and potential um, and benefit of that language has to hold uh, for the industry as well. And I'm looking at what place that really has it. A lot of the really complex iterative models where you need a lot of efficiency with a more elegant programming language than going down to things like C, C++. There's a place that that could benefit us in the clinical research world to make more performant models and take a more advantage of the um, computing hardware um, that we have available. There's additionally the best practices for interactive analyses for decision-making projects. That's been going on for a while, looking at all of these data visualization tools with the interactivity that tools like Shiny, that JavaScript, and all of these more advanced data analysis visualization kits that we have available, looking at the best practices for that because in making people easily able to produce these dashboards, I'm thinking more about um, the best practices of doing that UI design and um, uh, more consistency in how we address creating these visualizations or how these visualizations appear on the page when it's more than just something that's going to go into a printed or PDF file. Another initiative that's worth highlighting that I just put out a white paper publication is the end-to-end -end open source collaboration guidance. That had a lot of guidance. One of the key contributors was James Black from Roche. Um, and capitalizing on the commitment and the dedication to open sourcing a lot of the tools um, that they've done at Roche. And looking at that and explaining the, the post-competitive nature of a lot of the um, work that we do in the analytical world and pharmaceuticals because that is not a lot where the IP lies of the individual organizations. A lot of the analysis, our benefit and the advantages that we have to gain from collaboration are with getting things through regulatory to make those more efficient, um, to bring better consistency to it, to give um, better interaction between pharmaceutical companies and the agencies um, by taking advantage of the collaboration um, that we do and outlining some of the implications of that. So considerations around licensing, consideration around IP, um, about how to manage uh, open source projects as you start getting collaboration from groups um, outside of just your internal organization. Um, so those are some of the key ones um, that I want to highlight. And as we go into the next year, there's some more um, stuff in the works that will be coming out. So I'm excited additionally about the future of um, DVOST. It sounds like there's a, just a lot of work going on within that working group. Uh, and I guess I should just pause and say thank you to anybody who's contributing to all, all of this work um, through, through the FUSE working groups. If you're interested in getting involved, you can head over to FUSE.global and check out the working group section uh, for more information. Now, what, one question I definitely wanted to ask you today, uh, Mike, given, given your experience within, within open source and as a leader in the space, you know, talk to me a little bit about the, your why for open source. Where do you see the, the true value in using open source for clinical data analytics that we do uh, in our roles? It's a hard thing to pin down to just one answer, um, but I think that one of the biggest benefits of it is allowing us to evolve out of the, the status quo of how we performed things for years and years and years. With the advantage that a lot of the open source tools that are out there has to give us, um, you get a lot of the power that has been developed throughout industry and these different tools that you're able to bring into the processes um, that we have today. Um, one of the things that industry looks towards um, the most is shiny and interactive data visualization. And um, just as a tool, uh, what it allows you to do is have programmers who are typically doing statistical analysis now able to develop dashboards, um, have a consistent programming language that is used to create a visualization that ultimately can do the generation of a statistical program that might use the same language for a file submission that has to go through things like the ECTD where you're submitting a program. Um, and it has this potential to really streamline things, to make us more efficient, um, and to really help us um, improve the processes um, that, we, that we do today and have a tangible um, advantage in the submission pipeline. But um, if you look at it just through the lens of using open source tools for the, the same way that we do things, that's not at where the advantage really lies. Um, you're not going to see that uh, monumental efficiency increase just from changing the language that you're using. It's about changing the process. It's about changing the overall implementation, um, really looking at a more holistic view of how can we do things better. 
Um, and then the open source aspect of this um, is the benefit of just collaboration in the industry as well and learning from each other, um, improving the code that we have, taking advantage of the resources who are dedicating the effort um, and working on the same areas of focus from other organizations as well. And we have several collaboration groups like Fuse, um, but applying that to programming, applying that to software that we'll implement and utilize, um, we just have this opportunity to learn from each other. And we see through things like CDISC how that does increase efficiency, how it does improve interaction with regulatory agencies, and it leads to overall better impl implementations of the way uh, that we do things. Right, thank you for your perspectives on that. Now, last week, uh, Caroline Ferris from Domino Data Lab joined me at the September webinar Wednesday and spoke about uh, the Open SCE project. SCE, for those that don't know, refers to statistical computing environments. So, so Mike, when it comes to statistical computing environments, what are you hearing that organizations want in an SCE and, and how can open source solutions enable these features? This is uh, still an exciting area. A lot of discussion in the past um, several years has focused on changing the platforms, being able to adopt multilingual approaches, being able to um, funnel in and use other languages like R, Python, um, SAS all together in harmony um, in your statistical programming process. Um, the thing that excites me is be that I'm seeing an, a next phase um, of conversations. We're starting to see uh, the advantage of pulling in tools like Shiny, tools like R, um, and looking at data visualization and starting to think more about the connections from that back into um, the the day to day work um, beyond just exploratory. Um, simple things like generating patient profiles or more complex things like generating your analysis um, from an interactive visualization um, to be able to pick it out and generate it, but then funnel it through. That's been the discussion, and and we've we've really had our eyes set on this, but. What I'm hearing groups talk about more now is actual implementation, um, starting to get into more of the complexities of like how this has to work in your system. If you're in a Shiny application, how do you ensure that you're preserving uh, the role-based access to data appropriately when you open that application? And how do you scale that to an organization to be able to put it and fit it within the existing data platforms that we have? So really looking at how these visualizations in a validated um, GXP environment talk um, down to the data so that it can be applied in, the, in these systems. So what that tells me and the exciting part of it is that things that were in exploratory initiatives are funneling their way into validated GXP systems for looking at how that can become part of process. Even just like looking at organizations where they're putting things in exploratory budgets versus um, the actual um, IT budget, the actual business unit budget. It just means that the investment's there, that the um, value has been demonstrated. When you're stepping beyond that exploratory line, it means that leadership is really starting to see the potential. And look at like the last five years, it went from this will never happen to, all right, let's make it happen. And and that's what's exciting to me. I'm talking to these organizations, hearing what people are looking for assistance in. That's what we try to make happen um, for these organizations to really bring it to a reality. So just seeing the conversations change has been such an exciting thing to watch. Well, you just give me a segue into to, to the last question I want to ask you while, while I have you here today. Uh, you just looked back over the last five years. I want to look forward to the next two to three years. What do you, what do you think the next two to three years uh, within life science is going to look like with respect to data analytics? What are the things you think we should expect to see? I think my honest answer to that is that I hope in three years I couldn't have predicted where we're going to be because I don't think I could have predicted three years ago uh, where some of these initiatives would be when a tourist started, when um, I started jumping into this and when we, um, you and I started having discussions um, years ago. Um, about just some open source collaboration. I, th I think a sign of success would be would shock um, at where we go. Like I mentioned, seeing where these things actually get into production um, systems and validated use cases, I hope that we see and have people presenting on successful submissions using open source tools um, in an end-to-end -end capacity. I hope that we see um, evolution of packages, more legitimizing of the tools that are out there, maturity in Pharmaverse with more packages that really cover needs, maturity of those getting into more stable states um, as the industry begins to have more con contribution to that, more organizations contributing and out there in the active discussion. I mean, we've seen how much that's ballooned 
um, over the past couple of years. You can already see it in the job descriptions out there of um, what people are putting out there for statistical programmers. So I hope that role continues to evolve and that we start using our resources in those different capacities to um, become more multilingual and bring that data science flavor into it. Or what I think you often see in the data science world is just the continuous evolution of new roles. Um, that didn't exist before. Um, so maybe even seeing new positions are out there that organizations are hiring, hiring for. So I think that there's a lot of exciting things that are going to happen as we evolve. Um, again, I hope that we couldn't have predicted it. I really like that answer. Uh, th th thank you for that. And it's it's true. I mean, open source uh, is is all about collaboration, community contributions. And we see that currently within some of the packages, our packages that are being developed, but also all of the working groups and 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 uh, and sharing through webinars like the R consortium webinars and that sort of thing, sharing of knowledge, uh, and and I think that you're right. That's contributed a lot to the acceleration of what we've seen in the last five years. And if that continues to grow exponentially, then then maybe for sure we'll end up where you want to be, which is we didn't predict uh, where we would have been. Uh, so I'd like to to close out then by just Mike by just thanking you uh, again for your time and your perspectives today. To those that are watching, I hope you've enjoyed this session with Mike. Uh, so until next time, my friends, uh, we will sign off. Thank you.